Agile Global Webinar Series B4.0, a fourth iteration to a magic webinar series initiated in 2021. The topic for today's webinar is Empathy in Practice, the Power of Narrative Medicine in Healthcare. Magic Global Webinar Series B4.0 is dedicated to uncovering the untapped potential of innovation, creativity, and entrepreneurship that we call as eyes within the realm of healthcare and beyond. By bringing together like-minded individuals, uh, this series aims to eliminate new possibilities and expand horizons with insights from accomplished guests, innovators, creators, entrepreneurs, researchers, and educators. For a little bit of background, for the audience who have newly joined us, uh, Magic first ebook referred to as a toolkit or a playbook for serial innovators and entrepreneurs interested in low cost, low tech processes in healthcare and beyond. This amazing work in form of MedTech has been penned down by a total of 14, 14 authors and is an indelible contribution by each of them. Today, my conversation starter is chapter, chapter number five of MedTech, Narrative Medicine, the Healthcare Shoe Exchange. With that, I would like to proceed and introduce our esteemed moderator for the evening, Dr. Asad Mir, a physician by profession currently serving as Professor of Emergency Medicine in the Department of EDKK Village. An author, blogger, innovator, whenever he's off, an itinerant observer, a creativist, and an innovation enthusiast, mentoring many to pursue their calling in life. Welcome, Dr. Asad, and thank you for hosting this event is this evening for us. With him uh, joining us as a co-moderator is Dr. Marion Sovanman. Uh, she has been a former co-director for CCIT, uh, a physician by profession and a sleep specialist, also an entrepreneur by heart. Thank you, Dr. Marion, for joining us. Uh, now I would like to introduce a guest for the webinar today. We have with us Dr. Javed Bhanwani. He is a child and adolescent psychiatrist at CHI Emmanuel Hospital in, in Omaha and an assistant professor at Creighton University in departments of psychiatry and medical humanities. Javed, Dr. Javed attended Khan University in Karachi, Pakistan and completed residency and fellowship at Creighton University of Nebraska Medical Center. Uh, with him joining us is Ms. Uh, Sara Bhavani. She is an assistant professor at Brighton University in the Departments of Medical Humanities and Psychiatry. She earned her MA and EDD from Brighton University. She completed uh, an Institute of Education Sciences postdoctoral fellowship and at the University of Nebraska, Lincoln. Uh, 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 esteemed guests have shared their interest in mindfulness and medical education. They collaborate in curriculum development, teaching, research, and, nat uh, and national and international presentations. A very warm welcome to both of our guests on a webinar. Uh, Thank you. Just, just before handing the session to Dr. Asan and Dr. Mary, I would like to mention a few housekeeping rules for our audience. Uh, before we engage in the conversation with our guests, we would appreciate for the audience to mute their mics and turn off the videos for the session. All your questions, comments, and queries will be entertained through and through in our chat space, and interaction will be highly appreciated. With that, I would like to hand over the session to Dr. Asad and Dr. Marine to engage in conversation with the guests. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Eamon. Um, so Eamon did not introduce herself. Eamon, uh, was uh, one of our innovation fellows, and she completed a one-year fellowship last year, and uh, and so she's uh, she's been volunteering her time and effort, uh, along with Marine as well. And so um, so thank you um, to both Marine and uh, Eamon for being over here and supporting me in the Medjack webinar uh, series. Um, so before I delve into some of the questions, I'm just going to hand it over to Marine, and so we get uh, I'll ask I'll request Marine to get us started. Thank you, um, Eamon, and thank you, Dr. Asad. A very warm welcome to Sarah and Dr. Javed. Um, so, you know, it's a very interesting topic, right? Narrative medicine. We've delved into it. We do have our own experiences here at AKU with CCIT, you know, um, understanding narrative medicine, trying to utilize it as a tool. I would like to know, um, as my first question, to and this is to both of you, so one by one, maybe you could answer it. What piqued your interest in exploring the field of narrative medicine? Why did you choose 
to you know want to learn more about the field and maybe Sarah you could go first uh yeah sure I'd love to um so um how I got interested is in the field of really medical humanities. And I think um, narrative medicine falls under that. So I look at medical humanities as an interdisciplinary field, uh, which encompasses the humanities, social sciences, um, and the arts and their application to medical education. So when I was in my doctoral program, I took a course on how to teach um, in the university setting. And I was lucky enough to have a, a professor who guided me through that process. And I, um, I had gone through um, a, a medical situation and the care that I received from my physician was great clinically. He didn't have a great bedside manner. And I thought, how can I change that? How, how can I be the change I want to see in the world? So I thought about um, developing a course about mindfulness and being a physician. So I um, taught mindfulness as as two physicians, uh, two first year and second year medical students. And that was such a transformative um, experience for me. And from there, I was able to see uh, medical humanities, how that could affect uh, future healthcare leaders and narrative medicine more specifically, how those stories can really um, influence physicians, healthcare professionals as they go through their career. Super. Um, Dr. Javid. Yes. So... Uh, I mean, you can just skip the doctor part, Javi, it's good. Uh, so uh, for me, you know, one thing, you know, went to med school in the 90s, and I think, great, you know, in the same year as, I mean, I see Saima there, I uh, was attending, and the, uh, Asad, and we were all in the same class, and, uh, you know, things were different. I mean, we we were given a very stellar education. We had... We were taught good bedside manners, but still, you know, there was like a feeling that there could have been more. Uh, one thing you realize doing this for a while, I mean, you know, it's 25 plus years since we graduated med school and you realize that, you know, patients don't care what we know till they know that we care. So mm -hmm. we teach our students and ourselves how to know. We teach the knowledge part. We how do we teach the care part? And I think that's where medical humanity topics, you know, like mindfulness and narrative medicine, art, and all these things, I think really become important. And I think that's where my interest started to peak, you know, when I kind of had my own personal struggles. I mean, you do this for long enough and you start to figure out, like, how do I deal with this? And uh, you, you stumble, I got lucky and I stumbled on these things and was able to kind of pick up on this. And, you know, that's where the desire that rather than at some later stage in life stumbling on this, could this be something that could be part of uh, our early career teaching? Excellent answer, both of you. And you know what, I can very well relate to to both, to both the answers. Going to med school, you get so involved in understanding, you know, anatomy, physiology, other subjects. And I mean, as far as, you know, I'm concerned, I was somehow magically just expected to have amazing bedside manner. No one really taught me as a separate um, subject or as a separate, you know, course. And I had to learn, you know, all about it on my own. So I stumbled upon, you know, um, similar stories or um, got to know professors who were kind enough to, you know, volunteer their time to sort of uh, mentor me. But mm -hmm. what about so many others that don't get this privilege? So mm -hmm. I think it's, it's, it's important to sort of, you know, amalgamate it to sort of incorporate that into um, the curriculum that is taught. Yeah. And as we know, like in healthcare, not just doctors, but nurses and pharmacists and everybody, the burnout rate is so high, you know, one in two uh, people in healthcare have had some sort of burnout. And mm -hmm. a lot of the people who have had that burnout don't even have the awareness that there's something going on. And uh, they're still working. I mean, we all have had 
providers that we have had, nurses, doctors, pharmacists, dentists. Uh, if I'm missing somebody, I'm not you know, missing it intentionally, so I uh, apologize, but uh, uh, but you know they 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 tend to just not have that love and passion that you have in the early career. And that kind of creeps up on you. So how do you create that awareness that this is happening if you're not talking about it? You're not talking directly, indirectly in multiple ways. True. Plus, you know, one of the advantages that we noticed was it serves as, as a bridge, right? So sometimes even patients don't understand the burnout that healthcare providers are experiencing. So mm -hmm. it sort of helps the patients empathize with the healthcare providers too, that maybe, you know what, they're probably going through something too. And mm -hmm. for patients, the support it provides that maybe you're not alone, there may be others experiencing what you're experiencing, and maybe their stories can help you cope better. Mm -hmm. So with that, I do have another question for um, Sarah. So I'd like you to share more about your experience in, you know, utilizing um, mindfulness and the humanities aspect and narrative medicine as a tool for academic teaching. Oh, wow. That's loaded. <laughs> That's a great <laughs> question, actually. So as I was thinking about this over the last couple of days, um, Mindfulness is so critical, right? Because it, it forces us to be in the moment. So when mm -hmm. I walk, well, actually, before I walk into the classroom, I will say to myself, may I be the teacher my students need today? Because what they need on Monday could be different than what they need on Wednesday. And being able to, as an educator, um, facilitate conversations between them is very important. So they kind of take you where you want to go. Now, that being said, I still have rubrics. I still have things that I, I want to cover and I want to get them to know. But it's very important for me to be in the moment mindful. Um, you can't really take time off when you're in teaching, right? So you have to be there fully, fully present. I can't, you know, be checking Facebook on my phone. I I really need to be there with them and see where they take where they take the discussion. Um, and mm -hmm. it's also my job to be, to facilitate that conversation, right? So um, making sure that the students feel like it's it's a safe space to talk about the things that are bothering them, They're, um, that they can learn from one another. I always tell them they're going to learn more from each other than they will from me. Um, hopefully that's not totally the case. I hope I have something to offer. <laughs> um, but they will learn from one another. They're going through either medical school or psychiatry residency or pre-med, and they will learn so much from each other, but it's up to me to make that setting um, when, where they feel safe, and it's on me to be mindful in that situation. Well, excellent. Um, and that makes sense, you know. Um, two very important things, to be present, to be mindful, um, you know, you yourself as an educator, and then make sure you get them through whatever the curriculum is planned for the day. Um, so my next question is for Javi. Um, so I'd like to know about your experience as a child and adolescent psychiatrist, and you know, how has it influenced your perspective on the importance of narrative medicine um, in know, patient care? Yeah, in patient care. care. In patient care, I mean, in patient care, I mean, when we talk with the patients all the time, I think what we need to remember is that uh, when we talk about, you know, when we meet with the patient, we take a history. You know, we're like, hey, uh, and as we know, the elements of story, there's a beginning, middle, and the end. When we ask about the HPI, you know, history of present illness, our question is, what brings you here? Mm -hmm. So we're starting with like, hey, I know your end here. Tell me about the beginning and the middle here, okay? So every 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 day we're dealing with stories. The stories are happening right and left. I mean, they may not be as you know fancy sounding. Doesn't need to be anything great or, uh, uh, but but they're just happening around us. And uh, one of the big things that I feel, and I also teach, you know, in psychiatry, I teach psychotherapy and. Uh, 
Uh, one of the things I talk with my residents and my students about is uh, uh, that uh, when we look at the data of how therapy and even medication and any kind of treatment, the if there's a therapeutic alliance, there's a good working relationship between the patient and the provider that almost like, I, I don't want to say that the patient has to like the doctor. That's kind of very different. You know, we're getting into different dynamic, but if they like it, fine. But even if they don't like the doctor, there has to be an alliance. And uh, if the one of the definitions, one of my really favorite definitions about working alliance is uh, patient feels that their story, they, they were heard or in a way their story was heard. They walked away feeling that. So when they walk away with that and then you, you know, our job is in a way, I mean, I don't want to sound kind of bizarre, you know, uh, in some ways we're selling a product to the patient, which is a treatment plan. Okay. So when we're selling that treatment plan, we, it's more likely that they will buy into that treatment plan and our recommendations. And then the follow through is going to be there. And that's where I think uh, it becomes very important. I think stories and listening, and I think that's where it kind of brings it full circle. It's not, I mean, we talked about burnout and the narrative medicine helps us with the burnout aspect, but I think it helps a lot of these concepts do play out day to day. In like, if you just want to be a better doctor, you want to be a better clinician uh, who knows enough, but also has, you know, like in our culture, you know, people say such and such doctor, I mean, they have Shifa, you know, they, 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 they have the cure. And mm -hmm. I think that's what kind of plays the part because that therapeutic alliance is there. They felt their story was heard. You were interested in not just your own story that's happening, but their story and the interplay between you and them. I couldn't agree more. And, and I think that's so important. So I think somewhere down the road, we become so involved in just looking at the patient as the next case of disease that we'll be able to solve. And, you know, you are curing them, you are giving them the medicines or the treatment required. But somewhere, you know, sometimes people tend to forget that there's another human being with emotions who is, you know, feeling pain or discomfort somewhere in his or her body. And the constant reminder for, for the healthcare provider to practice empathy and to know somebody's coming to you in pain. So just by listening to them or mm -hmm. making sure they feel heard, you know, you can take half the pain away or you could make them feel good. And that is part of, you know, healing or Shifa, as you mentioned. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I'd like to share like, you know, my own um, personal story. So I went for electives um, after med school and believe it or not, every, um, so I'd gone from Pakistan, I'd gone to Chicago and every Pakistani or every, you know, um, person, most people I met would come to me and they'd say, have you seen the way doctors talk to us here? Isn't that nice? And then, you know, then I started delving more and more into what is the difference? Why is everyone praising doctors? What is it that they're doing so differently? And maybe that is something that I could learn. And, and there was learning in it for me because they were talking to patients nicely. They were making them feel heard and seen. And, you know, just by trying to understand what they were experiencing. So I can relate to um, everything you've shared. Um, so now that brings me to another question. And I would like to hear from both of you again, because it's very interesting seeing two perspectives, you know, one from a healthcare provider's perspective and one from an educator's perspective. So you get the best of both worlds here. Um, <laughs> challenges. Sarah, for you as an educator, what were some of the challenges when, you know, because you have your major curriculum set to incorporate all of this? What were the challenges you faced, be it with, you know, um, the leadership at the academic institution or other people, or what challenges did you face? 
So, yeah, that's that's a great question. I would say the leadership at my uh, university is pretty good. Um, so my my boss, uh, Father Fitzgerald, is the chair of the department. So he's very, um, very supportive. And anything I want to do, he rarely says no. So um, that's that's a good that's a good feeling to feel like he has just kind of given me this wide berth to teach what I want falling under the medical humanities and and medical humanities is so wide so that's been incredible i i think probably the biggest challenge is um finding the time to do it right because the medical students and pre med students and psychiatry residents their schedules are packed right and and we want to make sure that they are competent physicians that is absolutely first and foremost right mm -hmm. um but i think sometimes the students and and by extension um the residents too they are pulled in many different directions and sometimes to use Jawit's term we need to sell this to them why is mm -hmm. medical humanities and narrative medicine why is that important is it on my step two or step three exams is it on my you know those exams well no not really but you need it just as much and so mm -hmm. sometimes um convincing them that that can be sort of a tough sell at times um and sort of um related sometimes poetry is actually difficult um mm -hmm. because they're like i don't get it i don't get it so i think um exposing them to that particular modality can be challenging um but overall we have had a really good experience um with with narrative medicine and medical humanities but it is at times, kind of that tough sell, you know, um, I don't really believe that people can actively, competently uh, multitask. So when I'm, when sometimes when I'm speaking, they're, they're studying on the sly, I can see them going through cardiology lectures. Great. But I also think not so great. Um, when you do two things, half um, with half effort, you're doing two things kind of poorly. So mm -hmm. um, I try to kind of flip that script and and get them to, you know, unitasking is much more productive. Um, so yeah, um, I would say overall pretty good, but sometimes the the humanities can be a tough sell. Mm -hmm. I hear you. And what about <laughs> you, Jeff? Yeah. What about I you? Mean, like what challenges have you faced? Well, I mean, I think again, kind of, you know, if, if, the way it sometimes, I mean, depends on my mood. Some days I'm I'm per perfectly, you know, irritated when they're looking at their, you know, phone or their, you know, uh, the decks of uh, questions on the on the website and doing the question answer, preparing for the test. Some days I'm ir genuinely irritated, and some days I'm like, yeah, that's the story. They it that's what they want to get out. That's their story, and that's mm -hmm. what they want. Fine. But I think it, it kind of depends on my mood. I think my day kind of plays out. But uh, one thing when it comes to all the narrative medicine, medical humanities stuff is that we uh, we have had some success definitely with the medical students and the department started with working with the medical students. Uh, a couple of years ago, uh, I was talking with uh, the department, you know, we, we decided, I, I kind of just jumped in. I was like, okay, where are we going? This is going well. So let's, let's, where, what's the goal here? So the thing they were talking about is that if, you know, they want to get more funding and, you know, money plays a big part. So if we're going to take it to graduate medical education, which is the residents and, you know, fellowships and all that stuff, uh, we need people to do it. So I'm a faculty also in psychiatry so Sarah, me, and uh, a couple of the faculty from Medical Humanity, and then we got uh, some other, you know, our program director here uh, was very open to this because I volunteered our psychiatry resident as like, let's make them guinea pigs. And we're going to do first ever in the country, take the Medical humanity stuff to the residents. And mm -hmm. we did that. But we were able to do it because we were able to get the manpower. I think the struggle that we have is mm -hmm. like all these other departments, program directors, 
I think would love to have this. And they have said that to me and other people, but it's like, okay, so who's going to do it? Who's going to come up with, because there's a lot of background work that has to happen. You have to, uh, a lot of these things we're doing, we have to kind of recognize what a particular group of people are, what their needs are, what they're dealing with before we bring these topics to them. And you have to, you can't just take a generic set of stuff to a group of uh, people. So that's where the manpower comes in. And I think that's where some of the struggle, I think I would say money probably potentially for future of it to continue to expand and continue to be there, I think is a little bit of a hurdle. Um, couldn't you agree more with um, <laughs> with your answer? Trust me, been there, <laughs> been in a similar situation. So I have another question, one last question for you, and then we're going to jump to a rapid fire uh, round. So, you know, taking a bit of what Chavid mentioned, and again, this question is for both of you, because I would love to hear both your perspectives. So you mentioned manpower. That is one aspect. The other as aspect you mentioned is money. And because we want this webinar to serve as, you know, a tool for entrepreneurs and even faculty at various institutions that want to introduce or delve into narrative medicine or medical humanities, what would you suggest works as, you know, well, how do I put it, um, monetizing narrative medicine or utilizing it as a revenue stream? This is this could be for people who want to or who already have startups that want to utilize narrative medicine or for departments at an organization. If they want to utilize narrative medicine as a tool, how can we sort of, you know, keep it running or what do we do for sustainability revenue streams? I would love to know. Well, if, if I had the answer, I would already be doing it. <laughs> we would have to go gone to all the residencies, I think. You have to find funding sources. I think uh, there is people out in the community uh, that can, you know, donate some money, and I think that helps. So there's uh, there's some resources there. There's some potential grants, but the grants usually are might for these kind of things tend to be smaller. Mm -hmm. uh, and that can be a little bit problematic. Like it can cover part of it, but not tons. Mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, obviously, if you are, uh, you know, if people are writing articles and stories, I mean, if you, you know, put it together and publish it, could it bring some revenue? But again, it's a very small stream. And mm -hmm. I think unless you have somebody comes in and says, we're going to give you, you know, a few million dollar endowment, it's 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 hard. I think it's going to be hard in that sense. I, I wish I had a good, better answer than that. Hmm. Yeah, so similarly, yeah, I, I I wish we didn't have this problem, um, but I would advocate for reaching out to the leadership in, in whatever setting that you're in. So we're in a university, so, you know, um, approaching the provost, approaching the dean of the School of Medicine, approaching the president, if if that person is available and, and interested. Um, I think having a lot of enthusiasm helps. And mm -hmm. um, I think that's infectious and, you know, engaging the the learners. Right. So they're going to let you know what they like and don't like. And if they like it and they find it relevant to their um, to their practice or future practice, then they can they can let other people know, too, um, within within the university as in our setting. So, um, yeah, that that's a tough one. That's a tough question. <laughs> Very interesting question. I'm just going to like chime in um, because there, so in terms of like, and I agree with uh, with with Javed and Sarah that maybe you know it's it's we've got to kind of look for pockets of money perhaps, but but there are um, examples of uh, physician writers. Um, I guess that uh, the books became bestsellers, right? So I don't know whether that's that's necessarily the intention, but they did delve into narrative medicine. Um, mm -hmm. Paul Kalanathi, I guess, I mean, he's the mm -hmm. neurosurgeon who wrote uh, When Breath Becomes Air. Mm -hmm. yeah, and, yeah. Uh, and then, you know, so, so th those, that, that I, I think a lot of um, uh, students, uh, medical students, nursing students, a lot of healthcare students do 
delve into those stories or those books as well. Uh, but yeah, but those are a few examples. And then is that lucrative enough uh, field and sustainability? I don't know. Medical humanities even, right, for that matter. I don't know whether it's, it's a lucrative field or is it just because we're passionate about these things and we do these things. Um, but valid question, right? So startups, and we, we've delved into this uh, just for Javed and Sarah that we've, we've considered um, a startup uh, around narrative medicine. It was like years ago, um, you know, like just uh, working with people within AKU or outside of AKU, putting together a community of uh, uh, creative writers and creativists and storytellers in different, different ways, not just writing, but also photographers and illustrators and 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 so on and so forth and telling telling stories that were related to medical encounters um with without obviously letting uh you know maintaining confidentiality and all so uh it didn't take off that well but anyways you know like keep trying different things so but but great question thanks great so um over to zanera zanera has like a rapid fire round planned for us Hey everyone, loving the conversation. It's been a very insightful chat and I'm just going to take five to 10 minutes from you all and I'm going to ask a couple of questions and it's open for all and anybody can, everybody can chime in whatever they like. So first question specifically for the guests, uh, what's uh, the most inspiring person in your life or someone who inspired you to take up your profession? Um, I'll go first. Um, Joe it inspires me every day. Um, he he is such a dedicated and um consistent human being, and I'm so glad to have him in my life. Um, I have been blessed to have so many great teachers in my life. Um, and I just want to pay that forward. And I love medicine. Um, I'm I'm not a physician, obviously, but I I am just fascinated by the world of medicine, and I want to help out as much as I can. So. Oh, thank you. I'll just say Sarah inspires me. <laughs> but uh, joking aside, uh, uh, I mean, like, I, you know, kind of just a little story here. Like when I was a little kid, uh, grandma used to, you know, like being a physician, how I aspired to be a physician. So as a kid and my grandma, and I think it was generations of wishes over the years from grandma to grandma uh, passed on that there has, there should be somebody in the family who becomes a doctor. And uh, uh, I was the first kid in the family who I jumped on it as a kid because I, apparently I needed attention and I was hungry for it. So I, I knew that was one way to get attention from grandma and uh, for other family members. So I, even as a little kid, I'm like, I'm going to be a doctor. So everybody's like, oh, and then you know, I ended up doing well in school and all that. And so I think that's a little story behind how I ended up being a doctor. But finally, I came to be like, you know, yeah, I want to be a doctor, not just to get attention, but I want to be a doctor. But I think ongoing, uh, you know, I think we both inspire Sarah and I each other. Uh, inspiration. I think seeing her kind of doing these things uh, for the sake of doing it, I mean, rather than uh, like, you know, and go like, we just want to do what we enjoy. And I think that's, that's something that uh, kind of helps us keep going. Great. Anybody else wants to answer Dr. Asad or Dr. Maylene? Sorry, what was it? <laughs> <laughs> My 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 attention span is like okay. What was it? Was the question? Like, I said, you need to just say Aisha inspires. Exactly, you. like Aisha inspires me. <laughs> uh, I I thought the question was like, does the power couple of Brighton University inspire me? Yes, it does. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, you know, just a just a, just a here's, here's a here's a funny story. So like, why why do we have Javed and Sarah as our speakers today? Is because I came across, well, we, we, we met and Javed and I met after like, I don't know, decades, right? We were, uh, we were in med school together at AKU and we happened to meet in a very uh, nice place, Rio de Janeiro. <laughs> this, and I was just tagging along uh, because of my inspiration, Aisha. Yes, correct. And I was just the plus one tag along. 
and and Javed and Sarah were attending the conference over there, and I and I roped them in. I said, uh, you, you you two are going to make for an amazing uh, set of speakers for us." And so, thank you for that. For you know, that's just so yeah. So I uh, I I am inspired by your story. So just you know, I had a question. I know um, Zanera is doing the 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 rapid round, but like just. How 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 does it how for for the both of for the two of you your faculty in in the same departments how does that work out for the two of you because you're like there all the time like do you have like similar office hours and all or like no okay so not similar no that's why but it works <laughs> we're, we're <laughs> probably but we did meet initially in the department of psychiatry where we had offices next to each other. And um, I would be singing ABBA in my office, you know, Dancing Queen. And he's like, Sarah, Sarah, my patients can hear you. And so um, <laughs> um, that's that's how it was. Uh, that's how we were. Um, that's how we started out. So, um, yeah, I, it is really fun to get to be able to work with him. I think, you know, we don't we're not um, in each other's space every day. I largely work from home. He's in the hospital. Um, but when we're able to collaborate, I think it's really great. I, I have someone so supportive behind me and, you know, when I say, how can I make this better? He, you know, gives me good feedback and I always really appreciate that. I think most, I mean, being in the hospital, like my clinical work does not like, there's no connection there. So only, so this met humanity stuff, like mindfulness stuff we do, or we do, uh, you know, any of the other, you know, medical humanity ethics stuff. That's where we kind of at the same place at times and some courses we collaborate on. So I think there's that connection. And I think we kind of bounce each other off. I mean, when we make slides, that's another, like one of the examples is Sarah's slides will are, have a lot mm -hmm. more information. Mine might have two words on it, so. Yeah. We have different okay. styles. Now, I don't like them too wordy, but he'll like have one word on there. I'm like, no, we need a little more than that. That's probably probably our biggest, um, you know, where we disagree the most is probably PowerPoint slides. Yeah. That and Eva. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Okay. What's your favorite book on innovation or story narrative medicine, you could say? I think Paul can't go. Kalanathi's book is amazing. I thought that was great, the way he writes it, the way he describes, you know, that when I forget, I'm forgetting when air becomes. No. When bed becomes air. Yeah, 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 that one. So uh, I think that's a very well written and very approachable book. And I, I would recommend that to anybody. Uh, I would definitely think that definitely ranks high. Mm-hmm. Um, I really like this, and I cannot think of the name, but it's written by Chekhov. It's a short story about how he is uh, ill and he's traveling through the countryside and, and nobody's paying attention to him. And that's something that we share with the, Joey, do you remember the name of that one? No, like, I can't. There's a yeah. horse in it. Anyway, it's so good. Yeah. And it will come to me as soon as this is over. Um, um, and we share that with the, the first and second year medical students. And it's such a great story about loneliness. And I think that's something sometimes our, our patients, the patients will experience. And I think it's something uh, healthcare professionals really need to be attentive to that, mm -hmm. that, you know, um, patients want us to walk alongside of them. Great. Okay. Uh, what's the most used application on your phone? <laughs> uh, mail. Yeah, I would say mail or um, I like Instagram. I like pretty pictures. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, what's uh, one word for your to describe your work ethic? Uh, dedicated. Uh, yeah. <laughs> the first word that came to mind was inconsistent because sometimes like I, I am, um, I triage, right? So um, I'll go by deadline. So when's the next thing due? And I'm sort of a procrastinator. I don't mean to be, but, um, and that's another way I'm different than Jawa. Jawa works ahead. He is amazing at that. I am, I do best with a deadline and I deal best with a looming deadline. So yeah, 
I would say sporadic. Oh, okay. Last one. Best piece of advice you've ever received? Oh, oh. I mean, uh, I think I can probably say this. Don't be an asshole. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, who told you? Oh, that? let me let me change that. Retract. Edit this out. Just be nice. Yeah, I like that one too. Um, best piece of advice. Just be yourself. I think authenticity is really underrated. I think um when we try to be something that we're not, um, it comes across that way. You can you can sense it. I think um one of the reasons I really like teaching is that I can I can largely be myself. And I think the students largely are, are responsive to that. They can tell. They can tell that I really care because I tell them that on the first day and I follow through on things. Um, so I think authenticity is be authentic. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. That was, that was cool. So you're done with the rapid round? It was, was it rapid was enough? <laughs> Yes, I got to tell okay. you, when I was thinking about that, that was the part giving me the most anxiety about this time. <laughs> <laughs> like, ah! But yes. I, yeah, and, and Marine actually announced it. I'm like, Marine, why are you announcing it? Shouldn't be announced. <laughs> <laughs> Give them more anxiety. Um, so, yeah, just I, this is, this is, I, I, um, I don't know if there are any questions or any comments. Um, just, uh, you know, I don't know if anybody over here has read um, Oliver Sacks. A uh, very famous neurologist who wrote mm -hmm. about his patients. Those were case studies or maybe case histories. Um, mm -hmm. And then Freud also um, wrote about, and, and um, um, I will let Javed then uh, Sarah talk more about uh, the psychiatrist and the psychologist or, you know, folks uh, from psychiatry. But but Oliver Sacks, uh, the, the book uh, that comes to mind is um, The Man Who Mistook His Wife for a Hat. <laughs> And yeah. it's a fascinating uh, book of short. I mean, these are these are these are short stories essentially, and and some of the patients that he came across. And these all these individuals had neurological issues. Um, they were rare issues. Uh, they weren't. I think they weren't really uh, very common mainstream kind of neurological um, disorders. Uh, and how he went about kind of uh, diagnosing and. But th that's a fascinating book for anybody who's interested in mm -hmm. um, that genre. I guess, or within within uh, narrative medicine, I guess. Um, I, I guess there was a question in there. Maybe there wasn't any question. But but my my question to you, uh, the, to the two of you, is um, uh, the the more that you've delved into medical humanities, uh, which we don't have at AKU, we have we don't have narrative medicine even at AKU. We've just we we've, we've done this as you read from the chapter and you know years of experience of like just doing these things on our own. Um, mm -hmm and um, not really formalizing the process because we don't have medical humanities. Perhaps now with the Faculty of Arts and Sciences, maybe things will be different, I don't know. Um, regardless, um, the, the, the more you delve into this, did it, did it inspire you or excite you to write your own narratives, um, encounters, um, medical encounters or healthcare related encounters of your own um, that you felt like you had to pen and then you put it together as as a, as a book perhaps or as a blog. I did all of those things, but I'm I'm just I'm just curious to hear from you, from the two of you, um, from the medical humanities perspective per se. So I haven't uh, I haven't really formalized it because the the issue, so to speak, is still ongoing. So um, my parents, um, well. Uh, I am part caregiver to my to my parents. My mother passed away in November, um, along with my other siblings, right? So I feel like I'm living that right now. My dad is uh, going to be 94 in just later this week. He's got some dementia and he's in a long-term care facility. And so a lot of my experience that I share with uh, medical students and and residents in that is my experience as, as a patient and also as a caregiver. So not only are, are physicians and healthcare teams treating patients, they're also by extension treating the family. And the family is part of that narrative story. So when Jawit's talking about HPI, um, you, you might be gathering information from multiple people. Like my dad never goes to an appointment by himself. And um, it's important for us 
his kids to be accurate historians. So when I talk with my students, I often bring these stories in like about my dad and my mom um, and talking to them about how it's important to be slow. Like you have all of this education in you, but uh, your patients and, and their families don't. Make sure you slow down. Um, and I, I often say, you know, I, there, one thing I want you to take away from my experience with you is that you remember what it's like to be sick and what it's like to be scared. Um, and I don't wish that on anyone, but I do feel that those negative experiences, um, can make you a better healthcare professional, carry that with you. Um, so while I haven't, you know, written it, I've, I have a journal I have with me all the time. So I'm jotting down thoughts, but I don't have like one case history of, or memoir written just yet, but I'm gathering ideas. And I, I'm kind of, you know, in some ways I kind of call myself lazy because I, I don't, you know, I, I, I don't sit down and write things down. <laughs> Uh, a lot of these things kind of happen in my head and sometimes I might have like a few words written down as, you know, but uh, I think what, you know, just talking about like listening, one thing, I, I think there was some data that exists and it's actually quite powerful data that when we talk with the patients and families, we, uh, you know, the data showed like how, at what point uh, the the patient gets interrupted. And uh, it's about under 15 seconds, the patient gets interrupted by the provider. And uh, that is fine, but the problem is that the interruption that happens, it's uh, not, uh, may not be, it might change the uh, where the conversation was going. So the further data actually shows that if you let the patient just talk, and they get to their point, usually 90% of the time, not always, 90% of the time, 60, 70 second is what they need. So it's okay to say something or interrupt the patient to ask for clarification. Or I, if the patient says, I fell, oh, did you feel, fell, did you fall uh, face first? Because that's important and you can ask that and doesn't change uh, the topic. But, oh, I felt, oh, was it at the parking lot or inside the store? Does it really matter? I mean, uh, so I think sometimes we have to be careful. You know, if we're present and we're paying attention and listening, we can just say, is it important for me to ask? Can it wait? And I think that's a very important practice because that's how the story has to be told to us. And that's how the patient wants to tell us the story. And sometimes, sure, they will go on and on and, you know, you may have to intervene, but majority of the time, just give them that time and, you know, hold yourself back. I think the issue is not that we interrupt them, but we interrupt with the notion that, or, or what it leads to is that it changes the topic. And that's where, you know, the we lose that therapeutic alliance. And, uh, and, and the slowing down is so important, I think. The other thing is that uh, uh, human nature is that we, when we're talking with people, we're also, uh, our intention is frequently not to listen. And this is, I think, Steve, I'm quoting Stephen Colby, uh, that we listen. We are not listening to listen. We're listening to answer. And as healthcare providers, I think our struggle is that we, always being asked for like hey what's the diagnosis what's the what's the uh what's the wording what's your ad give me the advice and uh and that's the struggle is that if we're going to say stop ourselves from like is it something like just be there and listen i think that can be a, that can make like that awareness where my mind's going so we do a practice with our residents and the students in our mindfulness course where they have to talk to each other five minutes nonstop. And in that time, they're not allowed to. Uh, and uh, they can ask questions, but just for clarification. But they're not allowed to talk about themselves. 
Uh, and again, going back to the stories that we connect with our stories, we connect with the shared experience. So somebody says, well, this happened to me. Well, guess what? It happened to me too. We want to, you know, that desperate need to connect. I mean, we connect because, you know, we have shared experience. So the struggle here is that we have to say, is it really important? If I say it happened to me, does it become about me? And uh, I'm not saying don't do that, but forcing with that exercise, we force you to do that. And then what can happen is that maybe next time you have that urge, you take a pause. So, you know, there's story happening or something evolving, a relationship evolving between you and the patient. And it shouldn't, the dynamic needs to be there. And I think that's where uh, you have to be careful how much of me needs to be in this to a certain extent. Uh, amazing. Yeah, I was just kind of like uh, I'm listening to you and this is like a uh, very peaceful way of kind of like the way that you're going about this. And um, and yeah, I mean, so uh, I was I was um, just following what you were saying. Um, is that is that an acquired uh, thing? Because I don't recall that from <laughs> med no, school. No, no, no. I talk my mind off all the time. Yeah, because you weren't like that before. No, <laughs> I no. Like, I can no. listen to you. <laughs> no, but take a, I mean, I think I've gone through a lot of changes. And I think, uh, and that's why I think a lot of me has evolved. I mean, you know, temperament and all that has evolved and uh uh, going through, you know, struggles, I think, forced me in some ways to evaluate, like, was I doing things that could be changed? And I think it happened, you know, a few years into, and I think going through a lot of this, like, way of looking at things and getting involved, you know, learning and surviving in a way. And I think a lot of this, like, I, I like I said this early is that you know, we, we learn on the job a lot of these things. And I think, like Marion said, like, you know, she had to learn this too on her own, but thankfully earlier in the career, but for me, it wasn't even in the earlier career till something happened. And it's like, okay, something's got to change. And I got to start looking at this if I want to continue doing this. Because otherwise you burn out or you leave medicine or do something even crazier, like go for work for a drug company. I don't know. <laughs> uh, and uh, uh, and that's where I think the evolution had to happen. And, uh, you know, because we, I think a lot of things that happen in our day-to-day -day and also in patient care is that we add to the story. We build a story around it. Uh, so we feel like somebody dissed us and we boom, boom, boom. It's like, did that person really diss us or was mean to us? Is that really what happened? Did the patient really mean to tell us that we're incompetent, we're losers, or, you know, say mean things to us? Well, did it really, was it really that? Or in a relationship, did my spouse or significant other, is it really what happened? Is that what my friend meant? We add to that story. We add our own narrative to it. And that's where the awareness is important. And I think that uh, actually has made a huge difference for me. Like being vigilant and, you know, practicing that and ongoing practice, because you have to constantly cultivate that mindset because it's not like you did it once, you're good. It's always going to be there. No, this is, this is amazing. Thank you so much for this because... Um... You know, we've delved into narrative medicine several times um, in these four years that we've done um, the MedJack webinar um, series, and um, and it's th there's been a few times that we've had this as a conversation starter. But I think it's fascinating when we have um, Javed and Sarah being our speakers because then you really delve into the um, the, the psych psychiatry and the psychology aspect of things. I guess, if I may. Um, and and uh, so the mindfulness, for example, right? So the mindfulness aspect of all of this, which um, I hadn't delved into to the same extent. My my um, 
foray into narrative medicine, if I may, was really from the creative writing aspect because I realized that I really I enjoyed the writing aspect, and it started for me in the emergency department. Um, so when Jave talks about you know just kind of like being there and just perhaps just listening, right? For me, it's also constantly learning that as an ER physician, I also can slow down time or I can slow down myself, even if the patient is kind of, you know, I, I am, I'm, I'm a pediatric ER doc, right? So I have kids who come into the ER and they're really sick. And if um, if they're having breathing issues or, or whatnot, I, I know that I can still kind of slow down the situation a bit. So I don't have to jump into it and I need to understand the dynamics and so on and so forth, right? So if if you had more time, I would have loved to kind of get your opinion, both of yours, as to how uh, medical humanities and narrative medicine um, could play a role for low middle income countries such as Pakistan, right? Because we have our own challenges over here. We don't have the kinds of grants and all. Uh, we don't have medical humanities over here. I don't think people will uh, will will uh, find those of much interest. Uh, maybe maybe that's just an assumption on my part. But you know, maybe in the future we'd be able to get into something like that. But I'm also cognizant of time. So, but thank you so much. I I need to stop talking. Uh, back to my co-moderators. Um, thank you so much, um, Sarah and Javed. Loved the conversation. And like I said, said, I think this demands for like another episode where we continue the conversation and, you know, ask your opinions about incorporating it into a country like Pakistan or other LMICs. With that, over to Avon. <laughs> So this was certainly a very inspiring conversation and uh, every time I was like about to chime in, there was some, something more beautiful to listen to. And yes, that's that's a very agreeable energy that I would uh, actually like to um, just say a word about that. Um, Javed said that, uh, you know, most of the time it's not just about writing about the narrative medicine, rather it's also about being very much vigilant about it, be, being the listener or the observer. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I rather believe that. So, uh, I, and I also think that uh, in, in the field of healthcare, um, psychology ties, like I, psychology or psychiatry ties more into the narrative medicine and, you know, how to educate the healthcare workers into actually building that up in the field. Uh, so, that's what I personally think. And thank you so much for this beautiful evening. Uh, also, for the audience, thank you all for joining us today. Remember, the power of narrative medicine lies in its ability to bridge the empathy gap in healthcare, fostering deeper connections and understanding between caregivers and patients. Let's continue to champion empathy and storytelling in our practices and inspire others to do the same. Stay innovative, stay compassionate, and keep stories growing. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. Until next time. Thank you. Thank mm -hmm.